Hi, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Woodswise Lunch Hour. My name is Andy Schultz. I'm the landowner outreach forester for the Maine Forest Service. This is our fourth Woodswise Lunch Hour. Uh, we learn a little bit more each time, but uh, as always, bear with us if the technology um, decides to do something different than what we would like it to. But hope you all had relatively easy time signing on. Uh, a couple of ground rules, as I've mentioned already, please keep your microphones muted and your cameras off during the first part of the of the session, uh, which will be a presentation. Uh, presentation will be by Dan Jacobs, uh, one of the main forest service district foresters based in Island Falls. Uh, the title of the presentation is The Woods in Your Backyard. And uh, that'll go about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll take some questions, both from the chat and live about the presentation. And after that, uh, some questions that have been sent in already um, previous, we'll, we'll get to addressing those at that time. Just want to mention we are recording this uh, so that we can post it on, on our website at a later date. And um, we hope that it will be as interactive as we can make it. Uh, again, we appreciate your patience um, as we continue to learn about the technology. So I think with that, Dan, are you ready? Uh, so my name is Dan Jacobs. I'm a district forest in Forest Service. My office is in Island Falls, uh, and I cover primarily Southern Aroostook County. Um, I've got a short presentation today, like Andy said. It includes uh, one short video towards the end, and then there's going to be some time for questions, and we will do our best to answer the questions that you guys give us. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. Hopefully the technology cooperates, and we'll get into the presentation. Greg or Andy, can you see that? Yep. Set. Working okay Looking for you guys? Good. Looking good. Okay, so this uh, presentation isn't very long, um, hopefully less than 30 minutes. And it's just an overview of our publication, The Woods in Your Backyard, second edition. Uh, this is a main forest service uh, publication. And uh, it initially came out in 1999. So I'll give you a little bit of the history along with an overview of the new publication. Uh, and I'm sure some folks here are familiar with that original uh, publication from 1999. It was uh, very well received by a lot of different folks and we distributed a lot of copies statewide. These are the topics I'm gonna cover today. Uh, nothing too intense. Uh, it's just going to be an overview, like I said. We'll go through the background of the publication, uh, the Woods in Your Backyard audience, uh, who's going to benefit most from this book. Uh, we'll talk about the Woods in Your Backyard team that put the book together, a uh, very diverse team, at times a big team, and uh, brought a lot of varying expertise to the table. And I was uh, part of that team. Uh, I'll also cover the parts of the book and uh, using the book. This will give a little bit of uh, insight into what's inside the book. Uh, towards the end, after the video, I will review how you can get a copy of the book, which is based on our uh, distribution policy. And then we'll have a period of time for some questions. Uh, so this is just a little snapshot of what I like to call uh, the Maine Forest Service premier publications. Uh, these are the ones that folks will probably be most familiar with. And of course, uh, the one in the center with the biggest halo is the one we're going to be talking about uh, today, primarily. Uh, I'll just give a little quick uh, one or two lines about each one of these publications. Uh, what will my woods look like? And I'll do this uh, starting with that publication and going clockwise. Uh, this is a, a 
fairly new publication, about two years old, maybe. Uh, very well received. People seem to really enjoy it and they're getting a lot out of it. Uh, it gives uh, landowners an idea of what to expect when forestry treatments are implemented. So such as a, a commercial thinning and a softwood stand. Uh, it, for that, there would be before, during and after pictures, uh, description and discussion about what's happening and what happened. Uh, so very good book. Uh, next is the Forestry Rules of Maine, which was initially put out in 2014. Uh, this uh, filled a pretty big gap. Um, it's an overview of all the regulations that pertain to forestry, and uh, it's in plain English, not legalese. So this has been a very helpful book for loggers, foresters, and landowners. Uh, next is what most of us call the BMP book or BMP manual. And this is a, a manual about the things we can do to protect water quality on harvest operations. Uh, this was a little bit of a groundbreaking book when it came out in 2004, uh, because previous BMP manuals were always prescriptive and had recipes for how to do things to protect water quality. Uh, this book is really outcome based, and uh, that was a big departure at the time from the way books uh, had been uh, put together. So, uh, in fact, a lot of states throughout the country have followed our lead and uh, put together similar publications. Probably the most recognizable Maine Forest Service book is The Trees of Maine. Uh, definitely our most popular publication. Uh, I've seen this sold at bookstores around the state, state over the years. Uh, this has been uh, in production since 1908. I think uh, from the records I saw that that year, 3,000 copies were printed and distributed to school students. Uh, so it's been out for a long time. This is a full color version that was put together in 2008. Uh, and I think it is the best tree ID book in the state of Maine. So uh, get your hands on a copy of that if you don't have one already. Uh, this slide just shows the two covers, uh, the 1999 edition of The Woods in Your Backyard and the 2020, 2020 edition. edition. I'm getting a little, getting a little bit of back. Um, um, if everybody can mute their speakers, maybe. So uh, this is a comparison of the two, uh, the two editions. Um, the 1999 edition was uh, fantastic at the time. Uh, but it was very outdated. So a couple years ago, we decided to start updating it and it turned into a complete revision. Uh, the new book has a lot of new features, uh, full color photographs from around the state, updated web links. Uh, there's even QR codes for uh, those who know how to use a QR code to find information. So it's a, a very up to date book. Probably about 90% of the information in there is brand new. Uh, and supplied by uh, primarily Forest Service staff with some help from the outside. Uh, so who should read the book? Who's going to really benefit from this book? Um, the old book was had a very targeted audience. In my mind, it was the very small landowner or homeowner with a little bit of woods behind the house. Uh, someone that had the woods. Um, this new book, in my mind, has a much broader audience. I think it's going to appeal to a lot of different types of people, uh, land uh, woodland owners, home and camp owners, teachers and students, and anyone with an interest in the outdoors. Uh, and I think it can help people uh, who have very little knowledge of the main woods, and it can help even professional foresters maybe uh, would find some useful information in this book. Uh, so much broader audience than before. Uh, if I was to narrow it down to who would really get the most bang for their buck out of this book, it would be the woodland owners and probably the home and camp owners. Uh, but a lot of people are going to find this a good book. So uh, why read the woods in your backyard? <clears throat> why would somebody be interested in this book? Well, uh, for one, it's going to give a person a, a great general understanding of the main woods 
and the woods on their property. Uh, it's full of uh, different types of project ideas and even a lot of how-to information to complete different projects. Uh, there's also backyard family activities throughout the book. There's eight of those activities, and uh, there's at least one at the end of every chapter. Uh, in fact, the video that I mentioned earlier is going to demonstrate one of these activities. And that will just be a very short four minute video. Um, the book is also a great way to learn about forestry and natural science lingo. Uh, there's a glossary in the book. We tried to minimize the use of technical terms throughout the publication. Uh, in the instances where we had to use technical terms or felt it was a good idea to use them, uh, we put them in bold, and then you can find the definition for those in the glossary. Uh, so that is really helpful in uh, getting everybody speaking the same language. Uh, the book will also provide tips on how to get additional assistance. Like I said, there's a lot of web links in there, uh, QR codes to get different information, um, and there's a great list of agencies and organizations uh, in chapter one that can uh, help you out in certain areas. Uh, for example, Maine Woodland Owners is one of the organizations that we link to. Uh, and then in a very general sense, this book can help uh, folks to improve their woodland and get more enjoyment out of their woodland. Um, it gives a little bit of a roadmap towards the end on how to start uh, reaching your goals and objectives and even defining your goals and objectives for your property. So a lot of reasons to uh, read the book. Uh, that red, actually, let me go back here. I did uh, put project ideas in red in this slide, and that's because I just want to highlight one of those project ideas found in the book. Uh, this is viewing wildlife, building a wildlife blind. This is found in uh, one of the chapters of our book. And uh, some of the things that are included in this are suggested locations for wildlife viewing on your property. Uh, some tips on the types of blinds and construction methods. And there's also a link in this uh, section to a really nice article from a Maine Audubon on wildlife blinds. Uh, this picture here was taken by one of our district foresters on the Audubon property uh, in southern Maine. So some of the other uh, project ideas that are scattered throughout the book uh, include assessing, assessing your property for uh, invasive plants and also producing and collecting wreath brush. But there's many more project ideas within and how to information to go along with those ideas. Uh, this is a pretty important part of the presentation because I want to make sure that we thank everybody that was involved in the team that put the book together. Uh, it was a pretty big team at times, like I said, a lot of expertise. Uh, we relied on outside help, but we tried to do as much as we could in-house within the Forest Service, and we pretty much assembled the book uh, at, at no cost. Uh, we paid for the printing cost only. Uh, so there were district foresters involved. Uh, we had rangers involved in the uh, wildfire and fire prevention section. Uh, we also had program coordinators uh, from our Augusta office help out with certain aspects of the book. And uh, then we also had um, several people from outside our organization that supplied a lot of help and a lot of content. Ed China is the senior operations forester for Huber and he helped a lot with the timber management sections, and he provided a great deal of input, especially on uh, woodland access roads. So Ted was very helpful. Uh, Nancy Olmsted from Maine Natural Areas Program. She is an invasive plant biologist, and uh, you can probably figure it out. Uh, she provided all the information on invasive plants uh, and all the great uh, pictures and photography that we have of the invasive species. Kara Sohal, uh, she is a epidemiologist at Maine CDC. 
primarily uh, she provided the content for the tick and mosquito borne pathogens and she did some other uh, help for us, uh, some other edits and reviews for us as well. I think probably uh, the one person that maybe put the most time into this book is Rondi Doran and she is um, works directly for the director of the Forest Service in Augusta and she um, put all the pieces together, made it look nice, made it sound right, uh, made it look good. Uh, she spent countless hours working on this project to, to bring it all together. So I think that um, we owe her a big thank you for doing all the work that she did. These are the six chapters that can be found in the book. I'll just give a real brief introduction to each chapter, and then eventually I'm going to focus on one chapter to give a little bit more detailed information. Uh, Knowing Your Woods is chapter one, and that's the basics. That's the introduction, and it has a pretty fun activity called uh, Scouting Your Land, and uh, this is a fun activity, but also one where you can gather a lot of a good basic information about your property. So uh, ch chapter one is a pretty good intro. Um, as you proceed through the chapters, it builds up to chapter six, which is where hopefully uh, everything gets tied together in the book and you get to, uh, it's a jumping off point to start implementing a plan to start to uh, implement projects on your property. So uh, it, there's kind of a progression as you go through the chapters. Uh, chapter two is optimizing non-timber resources. Uh, that chapter covers wildlife, recreation, aesthetic improvements, and a uh, variety of specialty forest products. Woodland hazards is kind of a neat chapter because uh, there's a nice section on uh, orienteering using a map and compass, and I know that can be helpful for a lot of people. Uh, there's also information in there on hazard trees, forest pests, uh, and uh, safety in the woods. Protecting your woods. Uh, this is where we uh, leaned on the rangers a little bit, and uh, they provided a lot of good information on fire prevention and uh, wildfire preparedness. Uh, we also have information in there on protecting water quality and soils. Uh, protecting your property from invasive plants. Uh, pretty interesting chapter. Growing and harvesting timber is chapter five, and, and that's the one where we got a lot of information uh, from Ted Shina. He, he helped out quite a bit with that chapter. And chapter six is from great ideas to action. Planning is the key. This chapter is where things sort of get all tied together, uh, gets a landowner ready to uh, hopefully meet with a forester to walk their property, uh, whether that's a district forester or a uh, private sector forester, uh, that would be up to the landowner and uh, gets them to a point where they're ready to start doing stuff on their property, start doing active management and implementing projects. Uh, this slide just covers a few of the special features in the book. And I, I call these special features, just a couple things I want to point out. Uh, a different person might come up with a different set of special features. Uh, number one, the primary resources. Uh, this is in chapter one, and this is a list of agencies and organizations that can provide assistance in certain areas, uh, like Maine Maple Producer Association or the Maine Woodland Owner Association. So uh, within that uh, list of organizations and agencies is all the contact information that you would need to, uh, to get in touch with them. Uh, the do you know questions and answers, there's one of these per chapter, so there's six of these. They pertain to uh, main natural history and geography. They're kind of just uh, fun, interesting questions throughout the book. And the answers are in the back of the book. And we included some pretty neat pictures along with these, some historical pictures and and uh, good imagery. So if you want the answer to this question, you're going to have to get the book. The uh, glossary, I've already mentioned this, but this helps 
everybody get on the same page in, in terms of some of the tor uh, forestry terminology. Um, but we've tried, like I said, not to use many technical terms in the book, but sometimes that's unavoidable. So snag, that's an example of one of the definitions that we have in the glossary. Um, I'd now like to just dig a little deeper into one of our chapters, and this will be uh, focused on chapter two, optimizing non-timber resources. And within this chapter, there are four sections, improving your woods for wildlife, uh, big focus on wildlife habitat, uh, beauty and adventure out your back door, which is a lot about outdoor recreation and uh, aesthetic improvements. Producing, producing specialty products. Uh, I have that in red because that's the one I'm gonna follow through on in the next couple slides. And then we have uh, in that chapter, there's two backyard family activities. And uh, one of the activities is making maple taffy. And the other activity is planting a hard mast tree. And in my mind, uh, making maple taffy is the more fun activity of the two. So we'll uh, continue with specialty products. And in the book, there are three specialty products that are focused on, and that includes uh, Christmas tree production. And uh, the picture here is from a local uh, producer in the Holton area in northern Maine. Uh, the center picture, maple syrup production, uh, there's a, a young person, very young person, uh, looking in a sap bucket, and that was taken at the um, University Forest in Old Town. Uh, the woman who's collecting wreath brush, um, I have no idea who she is, but I believe that's somewhere in Washington County is where that was taken. So we've got pictures from all around the state and some pretty high quality imagery in the book which I think adds a lot to it. With the maple syrup, these are some excerpts from the maple syrup uh, section of the book. And the maple syrup section, all I can read these, um, or you can read them yourself. Um, for New England's earliest settlers, maple sugar was often the most available sweetener. The raw ingredient of pure maple syrup is sap from maple trees. Sap runs in the spring when the nighttime temperature is below freezing and the daytime temperature is above freezing. And at the end of this section, there's some links and direction to get additional information. Uh, this is one of those project ideas, making maple syrup, and it's done in sort of a how-to type format. And it's broken into two pieces. Uh, there's how-to information on sap collection and then there's how to information on the actual production of syrup from the sap. Uh, and then, of course, at the end, you have the links to get additional information. OK, I think this is where Greg is going to show the video. This is uh, backyard family activity number five. This is the three legged compass walk. And if you have a copy of the book, it's page 66. Hello, I'm a Maine Forest Service District Forester, and I would like to introduce the second edition of the popular publication, The Woods in Your Backyard. The original version was printed in 1999 and was very well received by small landowners, educators, and the general public. The current version is set for release this fall, the fall of 2020, and it has been fully updated. The new edition contains a great deal of information about forestry, wildlife, and outdoor recreation. It's in an easy to use format, and it contains a variety of projects and activities that are fun to complete alone or with your family. In short, the woods in your backyard is a great introduction to your piece of the Maine woods. Today, we will demonstrate how to complete one of the activities that's contained within the book. Hello, my name is Nolan, and today we'll be going through the Woods in Your Backyard activity number five, 
the three-legged compass walk, which can be found on page 66. This activity, you will learn to travel through an area using a triangle-shaped route, and the route will take you back to a starting point. Now also, on page 64, you'll find a very detailed diagram of your compass. And now we're gonna start looking at the parts of your compass. Now let's go over the parts of the compass. Right here, we have the base plate. Right here is a movable bezel. Right here is your direction of travel arrow. Right here is a mirror and your sighting notch, but you don't really need those. There are compasses that don't have them. We have one, but you do not need one. And right here is your magnetic needle. And right there is your orienteering arrow. And when you put those together, that means you're putting red in the shed. And that's going to be very important for when we do our activity. Okay, we're going to start off with our first step. And we're going to set down our marker so we can find our way back to it. And now on our compass, if you'll come in close, we're going to turn our bezel so it, the 40 degree mark is lined up with the direction of travel arrow. And now we're going to turn our bodies so that the red arrow, so that the magnetic needle is within the red arrow, putting red in the shed. And now we're going to walk 10 steps. And that's our first step right there. And now that we're at our second step, we're going to turn our bezel again, 120 degrees, so that it goes on to 160 degrees, lined up with the direction of travel arrow. And now we're going to move our bodies again, so that the magnetic needle is placed within the travel arrow, and that way, right is in the shed. And we're going to walk 10 steps. And that's our second step. And now that we're at our final step, we're going to turn our bezel again 120 degrees. So our direction travel arrow is lined up with 280 degrees. And now we're going to place red in the shed again. And we're going to walk another 10 steps while keeping red in the shed. And that's our third step. The intent of this activity was to follow your compass closely. And if you're able to follow your compass closely very well, then you will have ended up back at your starting point, just like I ended up back at my tennis ball. Now, if that was too easy, you can make it more challenging by taking as many steps as you want, anywhere from 50 to even 100. Or you can turn the page and look at the four-legged compass walk, which is an additional activity in your book. Now, thank you for watching this demonstration and have a great day. So how to get a copy, this is basically the Forest Service distribution policy for woods in your backyard. Uh, if you boil it all down, it's one copy per customer uh, for the time being. Um, I don't know if that will change or not, but that's the way it is right now. Uh, the best way to get a copy is to uh, meet with the main Forest Service District Forester. Uh, if you're a woodland owner, this is a great way to walk your property, get advice about your woodland and uh, get a free copy of the book. So that's, I guess, the preferred method for landowners. Uh, the other option is to contact the Augusta office at that number listed or send an email to the Augusta office and they can mail you a copy. Uh, the third option is to go to the Maine Forest Service website and on our publications page, you can find all of what I call our premier publications. Uh, there's a lot more than just the five books that we've talked about today on that uh, publications page. So you might want to take some time browsing that uh, if you have an opportunity. Uh, but that's another way where you can get the book and download it to your computer. Uh, the last thing I'll just touch on is this Woods in Your Backyard web page. And if you go to the Maine Forest Service website, which is mainforestservice.gov, uh, there's a link to this page under Featured Projects. And this is a place where you can download the book. Uh, you can look at the book by section and by chapter uh, because it's all broken down, sort of an outline form like a table of contents. Uh, that video is on uh, this web page. 
and hopefully our, our initial intent was to make more of those videos to uh, illustrate how to do some of the activities. And that's still a, a possibility, I guess, that those will be produced and put on the page. Uh, so at the bottom of this, you can see that there is a link uh, to get to the Woods in Your Backyard web page directly. And if anybody has any questions about the book or other forestry topics, we'll do our best to answer those. Thank you. I have a question. My name is Jeremy. Sure. Go ahead. If I went online and requested the book through the website, approximately how long or what, what would my next steps be? Uh, yeah, the timing of that is hard to tell, be, mostly because of COVID and staffing levels at the Augusta office. I, I assume that you'd probably get it within a couple weeks. Um, from my understanding, there's no charge at all. Um, it's just we don't have uh, all our personnel in the office all the time at this point because of COVID. Um, so there could be a little delay. But my best guess is less than two weeks you'd have it in your hand. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Andy, did you have some questions that were sent in ahead of time? Hi, this is this is Richard Nass. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yes. So uh, this is the book is really good. <clears> Have <throat> you guys thought about doing anything on either on online or elsewhere on GPS? The next step up. Uh, yeah, we haven't talked about that. We used to do quite a lot of GPS training. And we based it on the Garmin 72 and 76, I believe. Uh, the technology for that has evolved so much over the years that we, we stopped doing the training pretty much, unless it's maybe on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, but we used to do like adult ed classes and night classes. Um, it's just, it's kind of a moving target because the technology is changing and improving all the time. And everybody has different GPS units. Um, so we have not talked about that, but that's maybe something that we could talk about. So you're suggesting that if I got a hold of my district forester, he and I would go out and do some GPS training. Is that possible? Uh, that would probably be on a case by case basis. I can tell you that I had a, a forester that contacted me years and years ago and was interested in learning how to use a GPS. Uh, he bought one and I took about half hour to an hour to help him get going on it. Uh, so I would say that it's a possibility depending on uh, depending on the district forester and the specific situation. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Dan, this is Mort. Um, a question for you might be how might you suggest to a teacher ways that they could use this book? Um, some of the activities would be useful for a classroom setting. Uh, there's, like I said, there's eight activities in the book. They're all pretty good. Some would be maybe more applicable than others to a classroom. Uh, so I think that's one avenue that they could go down. Uh, the other way might be to have the district forester come in, uh, do some kind of a lesson in the class on a certain forestry topic, and maybe the forester could go through certain aspects of the book that are applicable to that topic. Um, so I, I think there's, for the creative person, for a creative teacher, they could probably find a lot of different uses. And I'll tell you that when we put the activities together for the book, uh, one of the one of the ways that we figured out how to do it and the format to use was uh, the PLT, 
sort of their lesson plan. And we didn't follow their lesson plan directly, but uh, it, it's a similar approach. And I can tell you that one of the activities um, on soils is very close to one of the PLT activities, with PLT being project learning tree. Does that help at all? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I'd agree. It's a great uh, resource for teachers. I wanted to answer Richard's question. Um, I'm currently putting together a training on Avenza, which is a GPS type app that you can use on your phone or tablet. And I expect I'll be doing it during one of these noon hour um, trainings. That's great. Thank you, Terry. Um, that just uh, reinforces the idea of keeping keeping your eyes out for uh, future uh, Woodswise lunch hours and other presentations. Best way to do that is to sign up on the Woodswise wire or listserv. I think we'll probably be able to get that uh, link up on the chat. I did want to mention that uh, I put a couple other links on the chat. The first one, if you get back up there, you'll see that there's a a short survey that we would love it if anybody that's attended here would take a few minutes and fill out the survey uh, helps us uh, improve um, our, our uh, topics and uh, making um, you know making our future uh, presentations work better. So um, if you have any trouble finding that, um, should be able to find it up there uh, when when we put this up on the website. We'll also have something there. Uh, how to get to the um, to the survey. And also there's two links in there about finding your district forester. Uh, one of them will take you to a page where you type in the name of the town that you're in and you'll find uh, get the name and contact information for the local district forester. Somebody like Dan or like uh, Terry. Um, uh, we have a couple other district foresters on the on the call today. Jim Ferranti from Greenville. Melissa Gregory from Jefferson, uh, probably a few more that I'm missing. And also there's a, a web page for simply requesting a visit. Uh, so either way, uh, that will help get you connected. And that's a great way to do many things, including getting a copy of this book. And I'm informed that we have a minor typo on the survey. So I don't know. Does that mean that that link isn't going to work? No, but uh, you're asking people if they want information about an invasive pants. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, within the survey, yes. Well, that's that's the, the question that uh, kind of literally weeds out the uh, serious folks. <laughs> Never mind. Um, it looks like we do have the Woodswise Wire uh, sign up link up there as well. So. Um, there was a note here about adding links for uh, professional logging contractors, master loggers to the list of primary resources. Uh, I think that's something we can look into. Um, beyond that, are there any other questions about the presentation? Anybody wants to just unmute and jump in? If not, I'll go to some of the questions that were sent in ahead of time. And I think some of those folks are on the call. Just bear with me for a minute. Um, there's a question about what to do if I see a delgid evidence on my hemlock in my backyard. I live in Portland, not the peninsula. And I think the person that sent that in uh, at least was on the call. Uh, best answer I would say at this point is to call our forest health and um, monitoring folks, uh, what we call the, the bug lab or the entomology lab. That phone number is 287-2431. And we can get that in the chat as well. Also on the web pages for forest health and monitoring, we have a lot of information about all sorts of pests, uh, invasive insects, and other things that can bother trees. Uh, there's definitely information there about um, the hemlock woolly adelgid and there's a sort of another similar pest the elongate scale that's often goes with it so uh, if you wanted to get more information about treatment for that 
uh, you'd want to make sure that you contacted a licensed applicator uh, if you're going to work with any herbicides or pesticides. So another question. I have several large and by large that would be 12 to 16 inch diameter dead standing white pine, which I have left in my yard for a variety of wildlife habitat. How do I assess when the trees are unsafe or might fall into our yard and need to come down? Uh, Jan Santer, who is our urban and community forestry specialist. Uh, Jan, do you want to take that question? Sure thing, Andy. Um, well, uh, as with uh, applying any herbicides, um, the, the first recommendation we have um, for anybody who's concerned about risk trees is to contact a licensed arborist. Um, and you would want to check with our arborist division at the DACF to see if somebody's licensed and ensured that list is kept up to date. Um, you also want to um, ask the person that you, you hire for um, proof of insurance and their license. Um, <clears throat> but before doing that, there are a few simple things that you can do to assess risk. Um, not knowing the specific condition of these trees, you know, you want to look for signs of decay on the inside of the tree, how much decay is there, um, signs of leaning, looking for things like um, mushrooms around the base of the tree or on the, the stem itself. Um, and then you also want to consider what the risk is. If this is um, at the back edge of your lawn and there's no danger of the tree falling um, on your house or your garage or anything like that, then you know there really isn't a great amount of risk involved. Um, and I'm just sharing my screen, I think, I hope, um, looking at a chart here about um, the likelihood of risk and, and also um, looking at, um, you know, what, what the consequences of that risk are. So, you know, is the tree going to fall on something and how likely is the tree to fail in the first place? Um, and after you ask yourself those questions, you can um, determine whether or not you need to go to the length of, of calling an arborist. Does that satisfy as an answer? Yeah, I'm not sure if the person who asked that question, I thought I saw that name on the call. If they wanted to jump in, they had other follow-up questions, but basically working with a licensed arborist is the key there if you decide to do something. If you decide to take it down, yes. And I will share a couple of links in the chat box as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we also had a question. I would love to learn more about how to care for the 42 acres I just purchased in China, Maine. And that leads right back to the idea of calling your district forester. Uh, that is a, a great way to um, Meet your district forester, have them set up an appointment, have them come out, do what we call a walk and talk, look at your woods, uh, see what you have, uh, get help you articulate what, what your goals are to what you wanna do with it, and hopefully come up with next steps. Now, I believe that the um, our district forester who covers the China main area is on the call. Uh, Alyssa, you wanna just say hi and- Yeah, hi, I'm Alyssa and I, cover parts of Knox, Kennebec, and Waldo and Lincoln counties. I'm going to put my contact info in the chat. Uh, so if you want to email or give me a call, we can set up a time to take a look at your property and go over basic recommendations and any other questions you have about your forest. Great, thank you, Alyssa. Uh, the last question that was sent in ahead of time, do you know if any Douglas fir and madrone trees are growing in Maine? If so, where? Uh, I personally carried young seedlings from Washington State to Lemoyne. My brother and I planted and monitored them and they did not survive. The Douglas firs were unprotected and munched on by some critter and the madrone died. Um, just anecdotally, I do know of a, 
couple places where some Douglas fir has been planted and has survived, uh, possibly because in the seedling stage there was some protective uh, tubing or something placed to keep the, the critters, such as mice or what have you, from munching them. Uh, they're, they're not really, they are definitely not native to Maine, so they don't really grow here like they do out west, uh, but they, they are somewhat grown occasionally for Christmas trees. I saw them uh, years ago in a small woodlot in the mid-coast area, and I'm pretty sure there's at least one, one of them growing on the University of Maine campus in Orono. Um, Dan, I think you said you knew of some further north. Yeah, there's a small plantation, at least there was about 10 years ago in the town of Ludlow, and um, they they didn't look awful healthy. Uh, they were getting a little bit, they were about pole sized, I'd say. Uh, mm. They didn't seem to be doing very well, though. Okay, as I said, it's not really their, this isn't where they uh, like to live, but apparently some of them can make it. Uh, as far as Madrone, if folks are familiar with it, that's a, a, a Western hardwood. Uh, I know I've seen it out in California, again, many years ago. I'm not aware of any Madrone growing in the state of Maine, and I wouldn't expect it to be able to, to adapt to our conditions at all. Um, I think, uh, Jan, did you have a, a link to something about, or maybe it was Alyssa you mentioned, uh, there's a place you can check about um, if you're thinking about planting trees, what type to consider. Yeah, I have a link to a uh, presentation the Belfast Garden Club did on planting for a changing world. And they mentioned some climate adapted species that they're interested in studying kind of in the mid coast area. Um, I think Alita with soil and water is kind of in charge of that. So if anybody's interested in climate adapted species, um, you can shoot me an email. It's there in the chat box and I can send you some helpful links to help you pick out trees. Great. Thank you very much. Well, that's all the questions that were sent in ahead of time. I guess uh, we still have a few minutes. If anybody just has a general forestry question that they'd like to ask. We've got uh, quite a few of our district foresters on and uh, some of our program folks, such as myself. Get all the, all the chat room questions get answered, Andy? I believe so, if not answered, at least addressed. We don't always, not always able to answer them right on the spot. So, with that, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, we do plan to do this again, and we'll put out that uh, announcement uh, as soon as we come up with a date. I'm sure it'll be January. Um, we typically have been doing these uh, on Thursdays, although it, it hasn't settled into a particular um, pattern just yet. So bear with us. We will um, get the word out and we'll look for uh, your thoughts in the survey about topics to to um, present, and I will put the L back in invasive pants just to take care of that small uh, typo. All right. Well, thank you very much, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, hey, Andy. Thanks to Dan and. Uh, Greg Lord, who, as they say, ran the board for us. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thanks, Dan. Thank Thanks. You.